and we are off again. We have two presenters this time, both representing the Digital Watermarking Alliance, and they're going to be talking about enabling scaling watermarking. If you have premium content, you need to protect it. And Niels, uh, who is with Veramatrix, and Mark, who is with, uh, he's a fill-in with NextGuard, not in the program, uh, are going to be talking about watermarking. And at the end, uh, you everybody can be a winner because they've brought a lot of color change mugs from the DWA, and uh, we can all come down and get one. All right, take it away, guys. Thanks, Troy. Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our presentation on an industry collaboration on, on standardization to, to foster digital watermarking. My name is Niels Thorvers. I'm um, VP Advanced Technology, a research with a focus on watermarking with very matrix. Yeah, and I'm uh, Mark Nakano. I'm the uh, Senior Director of Product Marketing and uh, Partnerships. Um, and we also focus on uh, forensic watermarking. So yes, we are, we are competitors. You don't often see us in the same stage. Um, today's different. We are presenting work um, we did together. Um, and one of the uh, organizations that we um, joined, that we joined to, to foster watermarking to, to explain common, common problems on areas that we don't compete in is the Digital Watermarking Alliance. So um, you see our logos here, you also see Content Armor uh, on the left who also contributed in what we are presenting today and we have, we have Alan here as a representative. And there are other companies that do digital watermarking. Who has been in the other panel on digital watermarking? There was one just 40 minutes ago. Not too many. Graham, of course. Uh, um, so it might, it might warrant to give a brief introduction on digital watermarking. And, and let me show you a sample that everybody has in the pocket. This is a $20 bill. Um, and of course, it has a watermark that's done by washing it that you can see through light. It also has a digital watermark. If, if you look at it the, um, in the back, it has a little 20s, little yellow 20s. It's actually a digital watermark. A scanner will recognize it, a photocopier will recognize it, and uh, block the photocopying. It's a little um, secret that the Secret Service actually doesn't want you to know. It's to block casual counterfeiters. And it's like watermarking, it's a um, machine readable code. But unlike what we are talking about today, it blocks you from doing something. We are talking about forensic watermarking, which doesn't block you from doing anything. It's there to trace piracy. So we, we embed a, a number into a video um, in order to know where it came from and if somebody leaked it. To do that, we need to be invisible. Um, top left, fidelity. We need to uh, put a signal in there that's invisible. Nobody can see it, not to degrade the uh, consumer experience. In the same time, we need to be robust. We need to survive. That signal need to survive uh, a lot of degradations up to including camcording, which is a significant degradation to video. So then it's about putting a bunch of bits in there um, and having a certain amount of time to get them out. That's sort of the, the art of uh, of watermarking and doing that securely. And then uh, today, uh, as you can see, we have uh, watermarking in all facets of, of uh, you know, different workflows, different products. Uh, one part that I kind of wanted to focus on that kind of affects everybody in this room is really the theatrical watermarking or digital cinema. So today, if you actually go and watch a movie in a movie theater, that, that, act, that video is actually watermarked. So there's actually data in the video. So if you actually sat there and camcorded the video and then you know, distributed it uh, as a pirate, if it's found, we can actually trace it back. And we can trace it back to which theater and which screen and everything. That's, that's kind of what we do. So that's, that's how like, watermarking is actually affecting like, everyday life. And another area where, where watermarking is highly used is in this um, content life cycle, right? So, you know, the content life cycle, you have production, post-production, you actually have initial release when it's actually shown in the theaters, and then you finally have delivery to the consumers or pay TV cycle, right? So in the pre-release time, which is basically during production and post-production, uh, you know, the, the movie is actually being worked on at this point. It's not released. It's, uh, you know, they're doing a lot of uh, editing, they're doing special effects, all that kind of stuff on it. Um, so what the studios usually do is they watermark everything before they send it out anywhere. 
So if they're going to send it from one post, post uh, facility to another, they'll watermark it. If they're going to uh, screen it for um, critics, they'll watermark it. So you, this is where you're always seeing these things where something gets leaked by a press critic and we can actually trace it back to who, who was the one that leaked it. And then you get to digital cinema, which, we, which I talked about in the previous uh, slide, where you are now showing it in the theaters. Uh, you know, it's, everything's watermarked. Uh, everything can be traced back. Uh, and then when you actually get out of that digital cinema window, there's something that's happening today or we'll you know, start seeing more in the future, something called early release. And so what early releases is, is while the movie is playing in the cinema, it's also offered on other platforms to the consumer, right? So it could be offered, let's say, from like a DirecTV or a Comcast at the same time as it's in the theater. So that's early release. So with, with these kind of new areas, what's happening is um, when it gets delivered to the consumer, we're going to talk in the next slide about better content also. Uh, this is causing um, security requirements to become greater. So watermarking is actually in this, this uh, enhanced content protection spec that was um, um, done by Movie Labs. And these are, these are kind of the new, harder um, security requirements that are required for premium content. So I'm going to talk about two trends in the industry that we're seeing today. And basically, the two trends are better content and earlier content. Those are the two trends. So what do I mean by better content? I'm not sure if everybody, there's a bunch of acronyms, UHD, HDR, WCG, HFR. So what that means is your content is getting better and better. So you have ultra high definition content. What does that mean? You have more pixels, higher resolution. That's great, but really the big difference right now is we have something called high dynamic range, which is HDR, high dynamic range. If you look at the picture that's up there, if you see, look on the right, that's kind of standard dynamic range. I'm not sure how well you guys can see this, but the illustration is the part on the left is high dynamic range. So you can see that it's more vibrant. Uh, basically, the, you can think of high dynamic, dynamic range as being better pixels. And what high dynamic range really is, a real simple explanation is, you have darker darks and brighter brights, and everything in between is enhanced, right? And then another important thing we have is wide color gamut. And what, what that allows you to do is it basically expands your color range from like 256 colors to over 1,000 colors. And then the last, the last part of the content getting better is actually high frame rate. So in cinema, we've seen frame rates usually go from 24 frames per second to 48 frames, which was what The Hobbit was shown in. Uh, to 60, and now there's a movie coming out by Sony uh, that's 120 frames per second. And this really affects motion. So the motion that you see on the screen with high frame rate becomes more real, more realistic. And the second trend was earlier content. So I, t I, I briefly touched on this er uh, in one of my previous slides, but basically um, earlier content is, is so, the st so all the studios are releasing content while it's also out in the theater. So we're seeing that trend happening um, you know, coming up soon. So what does it mean, you know, studios putting out better content? Um, break with the previous way the, the pixel brightness was regulated. One of the things is uh, higher security levels, uh, as Mark mentioned. And so there's a Movie Labs um, studio organization that published specifications for content pr protection requiring digital watermarking for ultra HD content. Higher resolution, better pixels. So um, that's a requirement. That's where we see a lot of traction on digital watermarking and, and how to implement it. We're fielding a lot of calls on, on you know, how to supply that um, for a variety of networks, including um, OTT and, and streaming, which is often at the forefront of some of those innovations. Um, before we get to how that is accomplished, maybe a little bit of a history on digital watermarking, which I've been in for 15 years, starting at the very be beginning where it initially was about creating technologies, just the algorithm on putting information in there that survives transformations, which is hard, which is part of the, the science and magic to make that, ma make that invisible. Um, but that's, that doesn't create a technology that you can use, it's an enabler, but you still need to implement it. 
First step on that was to make it very fast, maybe around 2005, to put it in, in set-top boxes. Uh, Single-use devices that haven't been designed to process a lot of pixels, yet we are trying to squeeze in an algorithm that modifies them, and um, that's a big challenge that you know we have overcome. All of these, by the way, are still ongoing, and, and we are refining that, but those were you know, the, the different steps if we needed to put a stake in the ground to define those. Adaptive streaming came along, big challenge. How do we mark different bit rates if you want to give that out from a server and, and deliver a uniquely marked stream? We're going to talk about that. But um, mainly what we talk about is, is the uh, final step to, to standardize it, to um, allow different industry players to adapt uh, watermarking, adopt digital watermarking, and make that scalable. That's, that's a big effort, and that's what we are currently working, and we are, we are showing some results of that, presenting it here. So one thing uh, that we started to do was uh, there's a UHD forum security working group where, where uh, a lot of our member companies are a part of. So basically, you can see uh, a lot of our competitors got together. I mean, part of the reason why we're doing this is we're seeing watermarking requirements being more ubiquitous. Um, and you know, they're, they're, they have to be, uh, it's basically going to be a point where um, there's, there's going to be more watermarking on more devices, on more um, distribution platforms and everything. So we see uh, the need to do standardization in order to get this deployed. So you can see from our working group that we have, you know, our competitors, Content Armor, Erdetto, NextGuard, Verimatrix, we all got together to actually start working on these standardized specs. And what we actually looked at, where we looked at three main points. So the basic watermarking interface points are during video preparation, so in, in an encoder, so we actually look, look, looked at defining some specifications at this point. Also during video distribution, and Niels alluded to this earlier, but you know when you're distributing this video, most of it's across the CDN. So we're looking at how do we, how do we build watermarking into a CDN? And then finally, at the device, you can actually do watermarking at a device. So you know we're we're looking at all three of these points and actually creating some open specifications to be uh, so that you know each of these players can uh, implement some type of watermarking. And we just I just want to let you know that for, on this UHC Forum Security Working Group, we're not it's just not just limited to just the companies listed. It's whoever's a member can actually participate. And Part of what we're trying to do here is we're trying to do a little bit of outreach also to say, you know, we welcome external participation because when we're defining things like on the distribution, video distribution CDN, you know, we're not getting necessarily input back from the CDN vendors. So we would love to get more input to make sure that we're, you know, what we're defining is, is something that will work. And so now we're just going to kind of get into a little bit of the details on, on uh, the different watermarking technologies that our companies, um, well, actually all of us probably implement. So one of them is called one-step watermarking. And like the title implies, what does that mean? That means you do watermarking in one step, in one, one shot, right? So normally you handle this either on the encoder or on some kind of playback device during the uh, in, in the in using the secure video pipeline to you know guarantee security. So what what does that mean? That means that you actually either uh, look at a transcoder or encoder and you have to do an integration with it, or you integrate directly on the device or on the client, right? And so the advantages of doing this is it's actually independent of any kind of codec or any kind of delivery mechanism you, uh, that you use because basically you can uniquely watermark everything either coming off of the device or before you send it. It's very scalable. And then there's no overhead during delivery. So what that means is uh, some watermarking technologies cause you to increase the size of the file because you're adding some watermarking you know, information. With this one, it's, it's, if you have a one meg file, it's basically a one meg file that gets sent to you. Um, yeah, so, so that's a fundamental way of doing it, you know, just modifying the pixels and see where we can integrate it in the encoding step or, or decoding step. Now, how we modify the pixels, that's our respective secret sauce. But that there's the option to do it in one step and something to consider, that's something we, we all field in the first, in the first calls. So that's something we're sharing here. Now, 
that's the that's a simple approach, right? You get the video, you get it in, in baseband, YUV content, you modify the pixels, and you have a uniquely marked stream. I think that's sort of where, where watermarking started. And that's that's ideal if you can do it. Either on the head end, you prepare uh, a few files, um, but you need to re-encode it with every file. That's why it doesn't scale well. You can't do that a million times. You can do it on the client because every client decodes the content and if you're integrating it there doing decode, you can modify the pixels and embed a mark. And that's, that's what we are doing as you know, respective companies. However, there are distribution mechanisms, scenarios where you cannot get into the decoding pipe. You cannot uh, be integrated in the device. Maybe it's already out there. It's bringing your own device scenarios. You need to try to do it from the head end. And that requires to deliver a uniquely marked stream without modification on the client. That's, that's tougher, but it's possible. Um, and the basic approach, and here again, that's um, you know, an, uh, more of a standard on, on how you fit individual technologies into it. The, the basic idea is that you pre-process the content one time. That includes decoding. You look at the pixels. You want to know where you can invisibly modify them, um, where you can apply things that you store the data without anybody noticing it. So you, you decode it, and then you recompress a certain section of it, what we call variants, sort of an industry term, um, where certain areas of the file um, are encoded twice. W one version um, signifies a zero, the other one a one. And like this you have a choice, a binary choice to embed one bit in this location by swapping out content on this location. Um, which brings me to the embedding. So that's a pre-processing. You create those variants. Now actually on the embedding step, you take a file and you choose whether you, in the first location, whether you choose the green box or the blue box to embed a zero or a one. And so you create two different files, zero, zero, and one, zero. And since you're only working on the compressed domain, potentially even encrypted domain, you can do that very fast. You know, don't need to decode. You might not even need the decryption key. You just replace um, an area of the file. And that area can have different sizes depending on the technology. It can be a few bytes for a macro block. It can be a slice. It can be a frame. It can be a whole group of pictures. It's just an area um, that you encode some kind of information. Here, it's binary. Okay. Now that, that enables you to, to make it scalable and fast. Now look into the, let's look into the different scenarios on, on um, the way the content is distributed. In a simple scenario, you have just-in-time server embedding. Somebody requests a file, you apply a quick, mod quick modification, and you send it out. Right? This, this works on an entire file for progressive download. It also works on just a chunk or segment for adaptive bitrate streaming. However, you need to have some server intelligence, and that's where you know watermarking squeezes in. The server just wants to crank things out, and here we are, want to modify something. But we have reduced that something to a very small amount. Um, alternatively, you can just have a stack of files, and you give them out as somebody requests them. So that makes it very easy, but you need more um, storage space. It doesn't scale so well. A somewhat hybrid solution is um, um, using the playlist to actually do the embedding, where you give individual playlists to the recipients. So um, you have two playlists, 00 and 10, and as you see, they point to similar chunks, uh, same chunk in the first section, and then different chunks in the second uh, section. And that's how a playlist will automatically assemble a uniquely marked stream. Um, that works with uh, um, HLS type templates where you can actually reference individual streams. Otherwise you can put a proxy in the middle that will point to the right stream uh, and chunk for a given playlist. So that makes it um, easy in that the CDN can remain just the data storage and just delivers the segments that are requested. Now, the last variation here is a, is a client device embedding where a client gets the content and also the variants and then modifies them accordingly. So you need to trust the client and the client needs to be secure for that. One way where that can be done is media delivery, for example. Um, and one standard that exists around this already 
um, is the MPEG variant standard, where uh, it outlines how to store and secure those variants and then apply them. And guys, we are going to have to wrap this up now. I'm afraid we're at time. You want to quickly conclude? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. And that's you know one. That's the last slide. One one closing remark. This is a document we created now um, with the Ultra HD forum. That's going to be public soon. Uh, it's just in the process to be sent to to other. Um, companies for, for comments. So um, that's the first start and then we go in to define more of the workflow, possibly APIs later in this group. Terrific. Uh, round of applause for Niels and Mark. Thank you.